Hey everybody, welcome back. This is week 25 of Creative Come Follow Me for the New Testament. And this week we are heading into some hard waters. So just like we talked about last week where we studied mostly in the Garden of Gethsemane, this week we head into the crucifixion and it's heavy. It's heavy all around. But it's the same kind of heavy that we experienced last week in that it's this launch pad for our hope. Uh, this week you're going to see a little bit of the Savior's trials where we ended last week. They'll be caught in all the different synoptic gospels and also in John, and we'll study those, the experiences with Pilate and with Herod. You'll also see how his crucifixion and his death impact those around him, especially the women who are around him. We'll see that really beautifully in Luke and in John. I, there's just some really incredible doctrine around the crucifixion that I hope we can wade into. It's, it's hard because it's so heavy. I honestly have never had a week quite like this week when I was studying. When I was trying to put together the notes, there were several times when I just had to step away and go do laundry or step away and do, <laughs> to do anything else because I really struggled. I think it's because this is our fourth year, you guys, where we've seen types and shadows of the Savior all across the Book of Mormon in here and learn about him from the Doctrine and Covenants and then get him richly in type and shadow in the Old Testament. And now I feel like you start to see all those pieces come together. I think that's what the apostles are seeing too, which is why in all these gospels, they try to emphasize how he is this fulfillment of prophecy. That's a big theme that you're going to find this week. One of the favorite thoughts I came across, I think it was from Robert Millet, but he said, you know, that um, Christmas carol that we sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem, he said that phrase, the hopes and fears of all the years will rest in thee tonight. It's probably never been more applicable than it is in this moment than it was even when we studied it in Luke 2. This night, the Gethsemane and that evening between and the crucifixion day, this is a night where everything hinges, right? Satan, by the end of this week's study, will be defeated and Christ will triumph and everything hinges on this week. What's pivotal to remember as you study, I think, is all of this is based on agency. Jesus Christ chose to do all these things. He's going to have many opportunities and even temptations that hit him during this week to be less than what he was intended to be. And he chose to be everything God the Father asked him to be. In fact, one of my favorite verses, I put this in the notes, but I really love what we find in the Book of Mormon when Nephi is speaking messianically. This is in 19.9. It says, And the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it. They smite him, and he suffereth it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffereth it, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. This week, we're going to study the Savior's suffering. But what this phrase means in this verse is that he allows it to happen. He suffereth it means he allows this to occur so that we can have freedom. That's the whole purpose behind it. And he does it out of a love for his father and a love for us. And I just think it deserves every minute of attention we can give it. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. We're going to be in all four gospels today. So we've got a lot of ground to cover and it's time to get started. Where we begin in Matthew 27 is pretty close to where we left off last week. So we're going to let Matthew tell us the overarching storyline, and then we'll add in the other synoptic gospels to give you little details and then spend a little more time in John, because there's some new things in John you just don't get anywhere else, like there always is in John. But Matthew 27, we'll spend the most time. Where you kick things off, you're going to see we begin with what's happening with Judas. So the Savior has been condemned by the Jewish court, and they're about to take him to Pilate. And Matthew takes time to tell us what happened with Judas. So you can see in three, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I thought this was fascinating because it kind of adds to my thoughts before about how Judas may have had a whole nother game plan in mind. Remember, he was going to go his way. He didn't, he didn't want to do the Savior's plan. He wanted to do his way. And again, I still don't know his motives, but in my mind, I think this situation where he is frantic because what he's just heard is that they're going to condemn him to death. And he thought, I think, that the Savior would put on a show of some kind. You know, I wonder if when everybody fell down in the Garden of Gethsemane, like we read in John last week, that Judas was like, yes, it's happening. You know, like he thought the Savior was going to do something. And instead, what the Savior did is he submitted himself. He put his hands out so they could put a rope around his hands and one around his neck and 
cart him off. I don't think Jesus saw this coming. And now he sees it going so far, so fast. And I, I hate to say I have a whole lot of sympathy for Judas. I, I think he had a lot of opportunities to go another way. But I have been in this spot where I have made a mistake that I thought I could control the ramifications and they got beyond me. You know, even a small one where you can start to see the ripple effects for your choices and you just wish you could pull them back and it's too late. You know, you can repent and you can try and fix things, but it's too late to fix all the damage that's been done. And that that's the spot Judas is in. What I know, thankfully, and what we know from the gospel is that even those ripple effects can be helped with the atonement of Jesus Christ. You know, I can seek to repair relationships. I can seek through the atonement to restore people who have been damaged by my choices. Judas is scrambling in this moment and he doesn't know what to do. And so what he does is he takes it out on himself. So you can see in verse four, he says to the chief priest, I sinned in that I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. They have a callousness that is pushing him towards a certain end, I think. I think this adds to their big mounting pile of sins, that in this moment with Judas, what should have happened is there should have been a mistrial. Jesus' court case was hinging on Judas being the witness. So if Judas is now saying he's innocent, I lied and perjured himself, Jesus should have been set free and Judas might have gone on trial for perjuring himself in their court. That's not what happens here. In fact, they almost kind of push him towards Potter's field. Not physically, but that's their impression. They're like, it's too late. And I think Satan loves this moment when, in fact, there was a quote, it's in the notes. I can't remember. I think it was a member of the 70s, but he talked about how this is Satan's strategy. He loves to camouflage consequences when you're in in the middle of things. You know, like you think, oh, it's just me. It's only impacting me. It's not going to hurt anybody else. He camouflages consequences in the moment of sin. And then when it's too late, he lets you see them in full color. You know, this is where Judas is. He can see the damage in full color and surround sound, and he is frantically trying to fix it, and he can't. So he takes it out on himself. And in verse 5, he casts down the pieces of silver in the temple, throws down the 30 pieces, and he departs and went and hanged himself. In fact, if you go in the JST, you can learn that he goes to Potter's Field. You can see this throughout the different Gospels, but he goes to Potter's Field, and he hangs himself and falls, and then his bowels spill out, and he dies. It's just this horrifically sad end to his story. And I found myself wondering, like, what else could he have done? I, I Again, I'm not trying to push too much here in the scriptures, but we have beautiful examples of people who realized that they were really wrong and then turned. You know, like you have someone like, we're going to study all about Saul, right? And how he prosecuted Christians and even was complicit in killing Christians. And then he turns and he spends the rest of his life trying to do good. Alma the Younger is similar where he talked about how he felt like he almost murdered them because he damaged testimony so deeply. And so he gives the rest of his life to do good. And I I just wonder what could have been. I don't think suicide is ever, ever the answer. And I think there, there were options there, but Judas chose this one. And you can see that the chief priests are wrestling with it because they don't know what to do with the money. Ironically, they recognize that it's blood money. This is money that has been soiled because of their choices and Judas's testimony. And so they don't want to put it in the treasury. And so they go and they buy Potter's Field, this place that Judas actually died. And it becomes a burial place for peasants and others. And it's just this interesting little twist that you only get in Matthew. When you go a little further in 27, you're going to see Jesus with Pilate. So kind of like we read last week, I won't recap it too much, but basically when he approaches Pilate, sometimes he answers Pilate's questions and sometimes he doesn't. Pilate's the one that's going to say, so art thou a king then? You're going to see some of that in Matthew 27. What I think is really interesting is the Savior's response, because sometimes he answers and sometimes he don't, and doesn't. And sometimes he'll give a partial answer and sometimes he gives a fuller one. And when it comes to Herod, he won't answer at all. And I found myself wondering, like, why is it so different? And then I realized, I think that's part of poise. I think being able to read the room and know how your words are going to impact the people around you, where their testimonies are, and how much they can appreciate and how much is casting pearls before swine, that, that's part of his gift. And so his answers are different. And I think it teaches me something. My testimony can't sound exactly the same to every group of people I talk to. I should be able to 
read the room and cater it to what the spirit will be able to communicate best. You know, I think the Savior is a beautiful example of that, even in this really hard circumstances. And just like last week, Pilate is constantly trying to shift the blame to somebody else. Like he doesn't want Jesus to be executed, but he also doesn't want to lose power and he doesn't want to lose popularity. So he's continually like trying to pass the buck over. And you can see the interaction. This is where he offers Barabbas to the Jews and they, they don't, they don't take the bait. Pilate is hoping for an out where he can still hold on to his power. He's hoping to straddle both those post-it notes like we talked about last week and he just can't do it. And so he gets pushed to a breaking point. What's interesting in the Matthew account is what you see in verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. I think this wife, we don't know anything more about this. There's lots of tradition that says that she became a Christian and all sorts of good things about her. But in this moment, the light of Christ that's within her is trying to ignite for him. And he doesn't lean in in that. I just think this is what, this is what, Heavenly Father does. Even if I ignore the Spirit, oftentimes He'll prompt somebody else to feel the Spirit and to be like, hey, Maria, look over here. I've just had that many times, you know, like where I'm frustrated or I'm resentful or I'm whatever. And then Jason will get inspiration and be like, hey, have you thought about it this way? And I'll be like, oh yeah. You know, I just think it's one of the beautiful things about how how the Spirit works. It's going to find all kinds of different ways to try and try to get your attention. And Pilate's wife is one of those. He doesn't respond. In fact, when he goes to the chief priests, they're persuading the multitude. So if you look in 20, it says that the chief priests have persuaded the people who are there, which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because this is Passover weekend, when there's a whole bunch of people who aren't normally in the town now here in Jerusalem. So it'd be pretty easy as a chief priest or somebody who's dressed to be like clearly they're in charge and you're a pilgrim coming in from North Africa or wherever you're coming from and you see them and you think, Okay. You know, like I can see why they would be able to persuade. I remember when we were studying the Palm Sunday part where people are, you know, laying down their palms and praising the, this coming of the King and wondering how could they shift in such a short period of time from praising him to saying, crucify him. And sometimes I wonder if it's because these pilgrims are new and the Pharisees and the scribes have a lot of sway, especially because they can control who can go to the temple and who can offer sacrifices. And if you've just taken all your money and spent everything you have to get to that place, you know, that's your pilgrimage, it'd be really hard to push back against the chief priests. And so they get, they get the sway of the crowd. I think it's interesting to see how Pilate tries to deal with it. So in 22, it says, Pilate saith unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, let him be crucified. And Pilate said, well, why? What evil has he done? But they cry out the more and say, let him be crucified. And this is the tipping point for Pilate. It's in verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Pilate's under the mistaken impression that you can, you can serve two masters or that you can be neutral. Honestly, I think they're both equally wrong. I think he thinks he can stand on this fine line of, well, it's not my fault. You know, and you see this throughout the scriptures. We saw this with Laman and Lemuel. You know, they're constantly trying to blame things on Lehi or blame things on Nephi. And they talk about how their choices were, it's not their fault. You know, it's because they got carried into the wilderness. It's because whatever, you know, you saw this even back with Cain and Abel, when Cain didn't have a good offering, he blamed it on God. Like there, this is one of those traps that we can fall into. And I think you can't have a repentant, broken open heart and still try to push your blame on somebody else. Even if someone else's choices did impact your choices, to be a fully repentant heart means you come to the table and you say, there are things I did wrong and I should have done better. What can I do to fix it? I just think they're missing that piece. Pilate especially is missing that piece and he thinks he can wash his hands. I think it was Elder Holland who said, his hands have probably never been dirtier because in this moment he's teaching everybody else that this is how you handle conflict and this is how you handle struggle with your integrity and he he gives in. And then in the following verses you see what happens because of his weakness in that moment. It, Jesus is scourged, he's delivered, he's crucified, he's mocked, he's stripped of his clothing and you know they put false kingly robes on him and mock him and what was fascinating to me, we're going to study this more in the other Gospels, but this is exactly what he told his apostles would happen. 
Remember when we were studying the parable of the laborers of the vineyard? And this word for word almost is what he told them. He said he would get mocked. He said he would get betrayed. He said he would get scourged. He said he would be crucified. He's been planting these seeds for a while now. And now they're on full display for everyone to see. And I just, the, the, I found myself sickened as I read it. I just, it felt like, honestly, the most comforting image that came to my mind is he is like a lamb to the slaughter. You know, we read that back in the Old Testament and we've read it again in the Book of Mormon. It is this, he is coming voluntarily and he will be led to somewhere really hard. And we'll see it in all the different accounts, but I think the Matthew account is particularly poignant. So go a little slow in those verses. And then I'm going to show you what comes next. Matthew's account is primarily written to the Jews. That's who he's hoping to convince that this was indeed the Son of God. And so a lot of his verses will echo what we've read in Isaiah, in the Psalms, like Psalm 22, you're going to see verbatim words that are in these chapters because he is the fulfillment of what they were talking about. When King David wrote those Psalms or whoever may have written them, like especially Psalm 22, you'll see some very clear connection points. And Matthew's trying to highlight those for his readers. One of the things you're going to see is that the cross is carried by Simon. So this is someone who would have been one of the pilgrims who come. Most people think he's from North Africa somewhere and that he gets this chance to carry the cross. And there are some incredible conference talks about how each of us get to do this to a small degree, that when we endure it well, and when we carry our crosses, whatever our burdens are, that we are uniting with Christ in a beautiful way. So you can go in the notes and learn more about those. But I really like what you see coming next. So if you look in verse 34, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. So when I studied this more, because I wasn't exactly sure what this meant, I found that this was a verse that talks about, it's a narcotic of some kind. So it's a, it's a way to dull the pain. It's some In some gospels, it's called a sour wine. And sometimes it talks about this mixture of ingredients, but it's designed to dull the pain. And so when Jesus tastes it, he won't have anything of it. He doesn't want... I think he wants a clear head. I think he wants to experience this in its fullness because he's all in. And so he he rejects whatever limited amount of comfort he possibly could have had in those moments. He pushes it away. It sort of reminded me of Joseph Smith and that story of the leg surgery. Do you remember that? Where he's like, I don't want any anesthesia. I just want my dad. And I just... When I went back and read that and then came back to this and knowing that this is the time when the Savior is going to feel a disconnect from his dad, like that's all he wants as well. And on the cross, they they will have a separation of sorts. And it just made me heart hurt. You guys, this was a hard week to study. Um, When you see a little further, that you'll see that the guards sit down. I don't know why this caught me off guard so much. They part his garments. So that's that's what you're going to see in back in Psalms 22. So that hymn basically speaks about his garments are going to be, they're going to cast lots over his clothing. When they, when that Psalm spoke of the Messiah, it prophesied that these things would happen. And then it happens right before everyone's eyes. And then after that, the guards sit. So it says 36 and sitting down, they watched him there. I just, I, the very fact that you could sit and watch the savior on the cross. I just, I struggled with it. I think what was so hard for me is what I learned about the cross. So I'm not going to go too deep into the excruciating experience of the cross. I think there's a lot of great places you could read that. I'm, I try to link you to some in the notes. But one of the things I learned is that a cross, even though in most of the artwork we see he's elevated, he's up high, you know, the cross is up high above everybody and they're all looking up. In most Roman crucifixions, they're only a foot or two off the ground. And so the people who are passing by and the guards who are sitting on the ground and looking at him, you know, they're right there at eye level. People who pass by are able to throw things and spit on him and say hateful things right to his face. And for some reason that was harder to me. I liked picturing him up higher. You know, I just, that's what he was dealing with. When they talk about him feeling mocked and betrayed, it is right to his face and that they sit there and watch him. I just, I just struggled with it. Then if you go on 39 and 40 and 41, this is where you see what people say. So the chief priests, the scribes, passers by the Romans, even the other thieves, the murderers who are being crucified around him, they all cast doubt. And it's fascinating because of what we studied 
before. So the temptations of Jesus, remember, we studied that earlier this year and how Satan gave him these things saying like, if thou be the son of God, then do this thing, you know, feed yourself, jump off the tower, do the, like they, he, he came up with all these ways to try and tempt Jesus. And Jesus was in a weakened state because he'd been fasting for 40 days. I feel like, remember in the Old Testament when we studied, that when we studied David and we learned that David, before he ever met Goliath, fought off a lion and a bear and that that sort of prepared him. I don't think it actually gave him a lot of skill with his sling per se. Maybe it did. I think it more likely prepared him spiritually and mentally so that he could know that he could do hard things with a sling. And I wonder sometimes if those temptations of the adversary are actually Jesus's version of a lion and a bear approaching that time when he'll fight Goliath, because this is much harder than fasting. You know, he's been beaten. He's been mocked. He's been He's endured what occurred in Gethsemane and he hasn't slept and I doubt he's eaten and now he's on the cross. So that's much bigger than 40 days of fasting and that's the weakened state he's in. But the adversary's tactics are exactly the same. What these people say, if thou be the son of God, this is in verse 40, come down from the cross. If the, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. That's what the scribes and the Pharisees say. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. It's, you can hear the adversary's voice in the, this group of people because his strategies haven't changed. And honestly, it's the same thing we talked about last week. If the adversary can get the savior to, to flinch in this moment, then everything he's done so far is gone. All that triumph of Gethsemane and everything he's endured in the last 24 hours, it's gone. And that's all Satan wants. And I think Satan can see how close he is to the finish line and he is frantically pushing him. For me, one of the hardest ones I think that would be for the Savior is what you see in 44, that the thieves who are around him also doubt that he's capable. In fact, in the other gospels, you see a little bit differently. They say things like, if you are the son of God, get us down. And knowing what we know about the Savior and Malchus, remember where he healed the guard's ear from my perspective, I think it's just because he hated seeing somebody in pain and he hated seeing someone bleeding and he just immediately helped. This spot where there are two men suffering the exact same pain, well, not exact same, but the same crucifixion that he is experiencing, I think his heart must have ached to help them because he knows exactly what they're feeling and he can't because he can't step off that cross. You know, it's the same thing we studied with Elder Corbridge last week where there is one way if Jesus steps off this cross, which he absolutely could do at any point in any any part of this process, all of it is gone. And so he won't, he won't step down as hard as it must have been. And then you see what happens in the world around him because of his courage. So in 45, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. He's going to be on the cross for about six hours and half of those are in darkness. And this is where that beautiful verse of scripture comes. This is in 46 where he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's a lot. I, I, I am not qualified to commentate on that verse but I will link you to a lot of people who are. Um, there are prophets and apostles who have spoken on that verse and what it means and how close God the Father really was in that moment, even though the Savior felt forsaken. And I just can't do it justice. So my hope is that you'll go read, <laughs> go read Elder Maxwell, go read Elder Holland, go read President Nelson and learn what they have to say about it. Cause it's his level of pain and aloneness in this moment. The only phrase we have is from the Savior himself, where he talks about how exquisite you know not. You know, it's how sorry you know not. He can't even articulate it himself when he's trying to speak to Joseph Smith. It is, it is impossible to capture in words. And he, he seeks connection with his father. What was the most poignant to me is to realize that this exact phrase is in that psalm. This psalm that people would have sung in worship services. I even heard in a podcast this week that it's potential that Mary would have sung it to him. Although if I were Mary, I couldn't have sung this hymn. You know, like I don't, I don't know. But this is, these are familiar words to the Jews and it should have caught their attention. Um, and it, is, it just doesn't, or if it does, it's too late. And so you see in 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. What's powerful to me about that, again, just studying the crucifixion and the experience physically, is that it puts a lot of strain on the lungs to be crucified. And you've probably heard that before, but where they have to shift their weight from 
the nails in their hands and his wrists and his feet. They're, they're shifting the weight between the different parts of the body to kind of compensate for this really uncomfortable position. And what it really does is put strain on the lungs. None of the wounds from the nails would actually kill a person. It's what happens on the inside. So the very fact that in this key moment, he is able to call out with a loud voice tells you something about the endurance of the Savior. I just think he sh in mortal version, he shouldn't have been able to do that. But because he is who he is, he pushes out sound and he then yields. Uh, this is when he fully submits to the will of the Father, even in this profound loneliness. And I just... I found it utterly remarkable that he's able to do what he does. And then immediately the veil tears. So in the temple, remember when we made that paper tabernacle last year, that big, thick purple and red with the cherubims on it, that big veil that's between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place rips. In fact, you're going to learn later that it rips from top to bottom. What's cool about this, you guys, is that veil is a hand thick. Like that's how thick it is. I don't know, five, six inches thick. And I mean, there's some reports that say it took 300 men to move it because if it's a, if it's a veil that blocks a place that nobody is allowed to go. And in fact, if you go in there accidentally, you could die based on what we learned in the Old Testament. You're not going to make it a really thin veil me veil. They make it so thick that it can't be opened accidentally. And so that's what tears in half and not just tears, but like, according to Jesus, the Christ opens so that there is full view of the Holy of Holies, because this is the gift of the savior. When he chooses to fully yield and to give up his body, give up the ghosts, things change. In fact, two big things change. First, the veil of the temple breaks, which breaks this boundary from men and God. He, passing through Jesus Christ, represented by that veil, you now have access to God if you go through his way. And then the other thing that breaks is the ground the ground breaks and there's an earthquake and the graves open up. That's conquering sin and death. That's what it, it just was like remarkable to me to watch this happen. People come out of their graves and go into the city and testify. And there is just this wonder. Like I just, you can see how it sets the stage for what will come down the road. You know, like we just crossed into blue belt level in our discipleship dojo. As we head into the next few weeks, we're going to see how the acts of the apostles occur. And in, on the day of Pentecost, they're going to have 3,000 people baptized. And you have to think that some of that is because of what happens here. Because the Savior is who he is on the cross and maintains his poise. And you see these ramifications happen on the planet that there, is, there are people who are dazzled and want to know more. And it's, he's, it's almost like you can see the Savior setting the stage for his apostles to be able to go. You know, almost like a Stockton to Malone kind of moment, you know, where he's like setting it up so that they can then go and teach and preach and people will believe. I just think it's beautiful. I think one of the things that's beautiful about Matthew teaching the Jews is he takes a lot of time to speak about the Jews who loved Jesus. And isn't that a beautiful thing after reading about all the higher ups who turned against him, that there are some in all different stratas of life who loved him and care for him, even in these hard, hard moments. Like in Matthew, you learn that the women, the women disciples followed Jesus even to this place. I don't know why the apostles aren't there, or maybe they are, and we just don't have a record of it, but they, what we do know is that the women, especially those from Galilee, are here. So Mary, his mother, is at the cross. You're going to learn about several who are there, and they are mourning him. I actually, when, in my margins, I put like, this is almost like the first Relief Society meeting. Not that this is the first time women have come together to mourn with each other, but the fact that they had to do it in silence. You know how we talked about earlier in the year that it was illegal to mourn someone who was deemed, like who had to be executed. And so they would have had to do this stoically in silence. Um, some scholars I read said that you actually could weep at before he actually died. And then once he died, it was not allowed. In fact, it was prohibited by law. I don't know exactly which one is accurate, but the fact that they had each other, I love. The fact that they, what brought them together is the Savior, I love even more. Because I think that's the glue that holds all Relief Societies together. It is, you know, he was a champion of women. He had women disciples. He brought them out so they could learn and study. And he praised motherhood and he used it as a metaphor often. You know, like he understood the value of what they do and he was constantly advocating for them. So for him to be lost would have been so hard. You know, I don't know if they worried that that meant their life was going to retreat right back to where it used to be. Like I just, they've, they've grown and they want, I imagine it's hard to see that leader 
lost. And so they stay with him all the way through. Even after the crucifixion, after he dies, he, he they stay. For some reason, they can't touch the body. I imagine it must have been against the law, but someone can. So this is when you learn about Joseph of Arimathea, another Jew. This is one who's in the Sanhedrin, who wasn't a part of the trials. This is how you know there wasn't a full Sanhedrin group there, because you learn later in the other Gospels that he was not a part of the trials against Jesus. I almost wonder if he like came into town at the tail end or something, and then is just horrified at what happens, and he does everything he can to help. So you see in the verses that he goes to Pilate and requests the body of Jesus. Traditional Roman strategy was if you crucified someone, you left the body there until it was not there. You know what I mean? Until something else happened to it. Animals, people, whatever. Um, in Jewish society, they did not want to have a crucifixion scene out on the Sabbath. So there was pressure from the Jews to take the bodies down. But normally those would have been put in a mass grave or somewhere uh, unmarked. But Joseph goes to Pilate and requests the body, and then he tries his very best to take care of it. So you can see that in 59. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. What's interesting to me about this is this is traditionally the woman's role. Like They would have done this part of the work where they take care of the body, where they wrap it in spices and they put the linen shroud on it. That's their work. And I love that they, even though they can't be the one to do this work, they watch. So you can see that in 61. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. They are watching to make sure he is okay. And I just think that's sweet, right? That they are, and I think it's good that they're together. I think they need each other and they're going to need each other. And I wonder sometimes if it was hard for them to watch Joseph do this. <laughs> you know, he if this isn't his traditional role, I, you know, like I've seen Jason wrap Christmas gifts or birthday gifts and I'm like, oh, you know, you all clearly don't do this very often. And I just wonder if it was hard for them, but at the same time, they were so grateful. And we'll learn more about that in, in a few other places. But I think the fact that they stay till this very end is a beautiful thing. Then you'll see what happens with the Jews at the very end of Matthew 27. This is where the leaders start to get nervous because they've heard rumors that Jesus has prophesied that he will come again, right? In three days, he'll rebuild this temple. And they know exactly what that means. Because remember, there's priest priestcraft happening here. They have a lot more understanding than they're letting on. And so they're worried. So they go to Pilate and say, it's possible that one of those followers could go and take his body and then they're going to claim that he got resurrected. Will you give us permission to seal the tomb? And so Pilate gives them guards and he allows them to seal the tomb, which is just to like put a seal on it. Some people said it was like a wax seal that you put on the stones to show that it had been tampered with. That seal would be broken. What I thought was particularly haunting about this, despite the fact of what they're doing and why, it's all happening on the Sabbath. These Jews who came against Jesus because of blasphemy and about their pious love of God. And then on the Sabbath, not only do they make these things happen, but they make other people work and they themselves work. Because what Pilate will say is like, you guys do what you need to do. And which means they're going to have to work to get the guards and to get the seal put in place and to take a lot of steps. And they will trample all over that commandment in order to make sure that they can protect themselves and the choices they've made. There's just a a darkness in their heart that I think has wiped out a lot of other things. Mark 15 is actually really similar to Matthew 27, both in what it entails and how it's told. So I won't spend too much time in Mark 15, but there are a few key things. Like, for example, I really like how he answers nothing to the Jews. When the Savior is on trial, in this fake trial, he won't answer them. I think it's interesting because that sometimes we see that with the church right now, where false accusations come out or things are blown out of proportion and you want the church to come out with some like really big answer. And sometimes they just don't, you know, I, you can see personal attacks about president Nelson, about all the apostles online. And there's no like counter argument from them. They just simply continue to be apostles and a prophet and they do their work. They stay fixed. And I think Jesus exemplifies that for them. In fact, I wonder if it's what ignites a fire in the Jewish leadership that Jesus doesn't react. You can see it, Pilate kind of is dazzled by it. So in four, he's asking him why he's not answering. And then in five, but Jesus answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. Pilate is a man who has wishy-washy integrity. You know, like uh, he, 
he is impressed by someone who can stand so strong. I think, I think that's his marveling. He is sort of dazzled by it because he's used to people groveling. He's used to someone who's about to be executed and in the hands of Pilate's choice, plead and beg for their life. And Jesus is not. He is calm and he is collected and he declares exactly who he is. You can see that in the JST at the bottom. He's not afraid. And I bet that made the bullies so mad, you know, because that's what I've taught my kids all growing up. Like if you're getting messed with by a bully, you should not feed the flame. You shouldn't react. You really need to either treat them with incredible compassion or walk away because either one of those options, it sort of neutralizes them. They, they don't know what to do and how to handle it. And I think the Jews were hoping that Jesus would plead for his life. I don't think they intended to grant it to him, but I think they hoped they would see Jesus beg. And he doesn't. And neither does Pilate. And it's powerful to watch. I was, there's a great quote. We've talked about it a couple times over the years, but it's attributed to Viktor Frankl, the concentration camp survivor. And he talks about stimulus and response. You know, remember how I talked about this? It basically says there's space between stimulus and your response. And in that space, you get to choose how to react. And there's freedom in that choice. So that even if you're, you don't have control of any of your circumstances, like he wouldn't have had in the concentration camp, to choose how I react to certain stimulus means I have some freedom. And in that freedom, there is dignity. You know, that's where the Savior stands in this rich dignity, despite the fact that he is, his clothes have been torn from him. He is on trial. He has been beaten. He, he has dignity in this moment and in every moment after it. When you get a little further into Mark, you're also going to learn more about what Barabbas was guilty of. So if you look at seven, he had committed murder in the insurrection. Here's what's interesting about that. An insurrection means he was part of an uprising against Rome in Jerusalem in some way. And then in the process, murdered someone. So what's risky about that type of person is that there, he's actually someone that the Jewish leadership should have been afraid of as well. I think that's why Pilate put him there. Because he was saying, look, he's a threat to you and to me. Barabbas, an insurrectionist, is someone who causes trouble and, and isn't afraid to murder in order to get trouble to happen. So for the Jews, that's really risky, right? They didn't want uprisings to happen unless it was going to for sure conquer, right? Because they wanted to stay in power among the Jewish society. And Romans, like Pilate, they also don't want insurrectionists around because that causes trouble and then taxes don't get paid and they get replaced. So neither, of, neither Pilate nor the Jewish leadership should have wanted Barabbas to be freed. But that tells you something about the heart of these men, that even despite that threat being the alternative, they still say, set Barabbas free, crucify Jesus. And so that's what they say. They demand his release. And you see the same wrestle with Pilate that you see. You don't see the reference to his wife and the dream, but you see him wrestling with this decision and continually coming to the people saying, are you sure? Is there some other way? And they just... He, he just can't stand. In fact, I think for me, the tipping point in Mark's version is in 15. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. I think mean, that's the big risk. When we are willing to content the people, we have stepped off holy ground. And it's tempting for all of us, right? You want to please somebody that's important. You want to look really cool on social media. You want to extend the kind of love somebody hopes for to them, even though it goes against what you believe. Like it's hard, you guys. But when we make that compromise to content the people instead of please God, especially if we have to step away from God in order to do it, like Pilate does, you've gone too far. It's, that's, that's the risk. When you cut that covenant line, you are, you are now untethered to God and Pilate is scrambling. And so things go forward. They take him in, they beat him, they hit him with a reed. There were so many things that I noticed this time. I've always known about the scourging on his back and the, the abuse to his body. I had never really thought about what his face must have looked like because several times it mentions how he is hit on the face and on the head and the crown of thorns. And I, I happened upon a painting on Etsy. I was just looking around and it had the same title as the one that's the painting that's in the Come Follow Me manual. That happened to be why I found it. But it showed a very serene Christ, but with a very bruised face, almost like someone who had just been in a, you know, heavyweight fight, like that kind of swollen eye. And it sounds irreverent, but it was actually kind of lovely. I give a link in the notes so you can see it. But 
I picture that a little differently now. I, I don't know if that's accurate. Maybe it's not. But I just think what he sacrificed is all the visible dignity that other people could see. And he offered it all up because every part of him is hurt. And I can't imagine what that feels like, you guys. I can't imagine what it feels like to get struck after every pore of your skin has sweat blood. You know, like he must be so bruised and so blistered and so swollen. And he's, he's just, he just suffers it. You know, like he continually will say, I will suffer with it. That's what he does. And so they take him to Golgotha, the place of the skull. In fact, you often see in the Synoptic Gospels that Joseph Smith translate that's, that to a burial place. So it doesn't necessarily have to look like a skull, although a lot of Christian traditions assume that. And Joseph Smith makes it seem like this is just a place where death happens. Um, and so that's where he goes next. And you, this is again where you see the wine that's mingled with myrrh to try and dull the pain and he won't take it. And you see the thieves on his right hand and on his left and begging him to save himself and come down off the cross. All those same temptations that we studied in Matthew, you see those in Mark as well. And I really liked what you saw in 32. It says, let, this is one of the temptations that's coming from the onlookers. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. What I think is hard about this accusation is they're, they've got it flipped, right? What the Savior has taught in his entire ministry is believe in me and then you'll see. And what they keep demanding is show me something and then I'll believe. What's interesting to me is as I was studying this, I wondered if there were people who actually believe in the Savior still. Like they still think he must have some kind of power and that he, at some point he's going to come off that cross and he's going to conquer and they're willing to let him suffer in this process. I don't know for sure, but I I think there's a there's a hardness to it uh, when you're out, you're allowing the Savior to suffer in the hopes that He will do some big spectacle. I think it's somewhat akin to when we fall into that trap of choosing to sin, thinking, "Well, I can just repent of this later." Because what that means by default is that I believe in a suffering Savior and I believe that He will forgive me, and that means I am taking advantage of His pain. And I am letting that play out. You know, I think it's Elder Holland who said it's like crucifying Christ afresh. I just think we have to be really cautious about that. And I wonder if some of that was happening in the Mark 15 account as all these people kind of stay around and wait to see what happens. You get the same phrase in 34 where it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you can go in the footnotes and in the notes and learn a little bit more. But this is where you learn that the veil actually tears from the top to the bottom, which I just love the visual of. It just means, in my mind, it means that choice came from heaven. It is a, he's going to tear open that veil. And if you will pass through his way, you can have access to God. That's the promise. And then you see the women watching and I, the same kind of story that we read in Matthew plays out in Mark. They watch this burial, they see where this um, tomb is, and they will participate more in it as we go into next week. Now we jump into Luke 23, so the third of the Synoptic Gospels. And again, it has kind of a similar storyline, but you get an addition of Herod in the Luke account, and then a few other little additions here and there. Luke always gives us that, right? His is written to more of a Gentile audience, so you don't get as much about the prophecies of Isaiah, but you get some rich, beautiful statements about how who this who this Messiah is and was. And I love the way Luke phrases things. So if you go on Luke, first you see that the charges have kind of changed. Like I mentioned last week, we don't really have an actual charge against the Savior. There's nothing that Pilate pronounces or that Herod pronounces. In fact, both of them claim that he's innocent, that he is a just man. So if you go in the verses, you can see the Jews kind of scrambling to come up with something. So this is when he they say to him, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. So this is where they're trying to pit the Romans against Jesus by saying he's a threat to you. He doesn't even pay tribute, which goes against what we've already studied, you know, where the Savior says like, pay to Caesar, what is Caesar's? So they're they're kind of scrambling now, trying to hope to catch him in some way. Even perverting the nation, to their mind, that just means he's causing commotion, which is true, right? Like he is he is fulfilling the law of Moses and causing a whole new covenant to happen. This is he is definitely causing commotion, and that was his goal. And they are struggling. You know, they they can't keep their power and their control if 
if he's around. So they really need to get rid of him. And you can see it in the verses. So this is when he goes before Pilate, art thou a king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, thou sayest it. So again, like we read in the footnotes in Matthew, he doesn't deny that. In fact, he says, what you're saying is absolutely true, basically. And then in four, then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. I think it's really interesting that several times Pilate uses the term this man. I think he's trying to say to the Jews, I don't think he's trying to be a king. You know, he doesn't, he's making it really clear. This is just a man. You know, Pilate doesn't understand who he's dealing with, but I think he's trying to say to anyone who will listen, he's not a threat to Rome. If anything, he's like a social annoyance to the Romans, but he's not a threat and he shouldn't be executed. That's what he keeps trying to say to the Jews. And then you see him pass things off. So basically what happens is he learns that Jesus has been teaching up in Galilee because the Jews are trying to ramp things up. And they're like, yeah, it's not just here though. He's been teaching in Galilee. And as soon as Pilate hears Galilee, he's like, great, I'm going to send him to Herod because Herod is over Galilee. That's a whole different portion of the area than Jerusalem is. So luckily Herod happens to be in town in Jerusalem. And so Pilate, almost like a hot potato, passes Jesus and this whole court case over and says like, you're out of my hands. That doesn't make him less complicit because he certainly could have stopped everything at this point. It's just interesting to see him scramble. So when he goes to Herod, there's this really odd interchange. So in eight, and when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he'd heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen him some miracle done by him. Herod has, I think, no concept of what is happening. We've talked about Herod in the past. This is not the Herod of Jesus's birth. You know, the one who executed all the babies. That's this guy's dad. This Herod is the one who beheaded John the Baptist and has this really creepy marriage and relationship. And his daughter danced before, like he's that guy. And because the daughter and the wife requested John beheaded, it happens. Even though he thinks the people are going to get mad because they all love John. That's who this is. And so when the Savior comes before Herod, he has no words for Herod. And I just, that tells you something I think about the Savior is when he chooses, he will not speak because I think he loved John. There may be lots of other reasons why he didn't speak to Herod, but the very fact that Herod is excited to see him because he thinks he'll do some thing, you know, he'll, he'll perform in some way is just sickening. And then when Jesus doesn't, in fact, he won't speak. He has his men beat him and he sends him all the way back to Pilate. So now in this same period of hours, in the wee hours of the morning, he's bounced back to Pilate's hands. And Pilate has to decide what to do with him. So again, he goes to the people. This is where you see that they've got a big multitude of people together. So if you look in 13, and Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people said unto them, "Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I've examined him before you and have found no fault in this man, touching those things where you have accused him of, where, whereof ye accuse him. Nor yet Herod, for I sent him to for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. That's what he says to this growing multitude of people. I'm going to chastise him, which means I'm going to physically correct him in some way, and then I'm going to let him go. And that causes an uproar. Because now the Jews in power are feeling like they're losing power. They thought they had him right where they wanted him. They got him to Pilate. They got him to Herod. And now they're losing it. So they cause a tumult, which is fascinating to me because that's exactly what what the Jews are accusing Jesus of doing is causing this tumult, but they're the ones that are actually setting that, those little minds around all the people. So they ramp people up. What's interesting to me is if over the next like five to 10 verses, you see a really big contrast where so much of the message of this week is about the savior submitting his will to the father's will and letting it be swallowed up. I feel like you also see what happens when a man lets his will be swallowed up by the people or popular opinion, because that's what happens. Look in 16, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Look again in 22. And he said unto them the third time, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And then by 25, he released him unto them for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. He has voluntarily set his will before the people and said, you take him. I just think the contrast between that and what the Savior offers is just stark. And it, it just puts me on my guard. I have to be wise. You know, I have to be cautious about 
believing, standing up for my beliefs. I think the prophets and the apostles have taught us to do it compassionately and to be careful, but also to stand, like to take a stand for what you believe and do not let your will get swallowed up. Because once it's swallowed up by the people, there's, it's really hard to pull back. And that's what happens with Pilate. So then you see again that there's a great company of people, especially women, who are going along with the Savior to this place of crucifixion. And only in the Luke account do you see this warning from the Savior. So these women are weeping for him, and he turns to them in this kindness and says, don't weep for me. In fact, who you should weep for is yourselves, because there will be a time that's coming where you will wish you were barren. Like That's how bad things are going to get. There is a, They will be destroyed in a horrific way when... Jerusalem is toppled, and a lot of the women will suffer incredible indignities, and children will die, and women will die in horrible, horrible ways. And so he's warning about that, and he says, if you think it's bad now, with when it's green here, like when the Savior is here, it will get so much worse when it's dry, when there is no living water around you, it's, it's going to get hard. And so that's a little warning, you see. What I love about that is it's so in line with the Savior's character, even though he's on his way to the most painful part, this crucifixion phase, that he will be worried about them and warn them about the pains they will face. I just think it's a beautiful thing. It's very Luke to tell us that. When you see a little further in, in verse 34, it says, and then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's one that we only get when it, in Luke. And thanks to the JST, you know that who he's speaking to are the Roman guards. What I think is really interesting is what happened right before it. So before he says this phrase, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What they have done is tear apart his clothing and they've cast lots. This actually gets mentioned many times in all the different gospels. And I found myself wondering like, what is it about the clothing? I know it's a fulfillment of prophecy. And this is just total Maria theory here. But my mind went back to, remember in the Old Testament, when we were studying Hannah and when she gives Samuel back to the Lord and she takes him to the temple. And then there's this one little verse that says she made him a coat every year. So she gets to go back to see him once a year at a festival or feast time. And she brought him a coat every year. And I always wondered like what that coat looks like and how much time she spent on the embroidery and what she put in the pockets. And I sometimes wonder if the reason we hear so much about his clothing, his raiment is because it's precious to him in some way. Wouldn't that fit? You know, if I were Mary and I knew what he was heading into, I would have made him something. <laughs> or maybe it's something he inherited from Joseph and he's worn it all his life since Joseph died. I don't know, but he sure seems to love these clothing to the point that like the guards strip him of his clothing, they scourge him, and then his clothing gets put back on him again. It almost makes me wonder if he asked it for it back because when they cast lots and they tear this clothing apart, whether it is precious or not, that's when he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I just thought that was beautiful. I mean, his grace and his extension of forgiveness is so big that it seems like any small forgiveness I'm asked to make pales in comparison and I should just do it. You know, like I just, I just think it's beautiful. So when you look a little further, you see him talk to the thieves that are on either side of him. We know from the verses that these aren't just thieves, they're, you know, murderers. They're people who caused insurrection and they are struggling. One is coming down against him and one is a believer of sorts. At least in this moment, he's a believer. And that's what you see that's unique in Luke. So if you look in like verse 40, it says, but the other answering rebuked him. So this is one thief talking to the other thief. And he says, dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. He knows that Jesus doesn't deserve to be there among them. And so he says this thing. He says, in 42, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, To this today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus only says seven things on the cross, and this is one of them. And it's not that he's giving this man absolution. What he's saying is like there is a spirit world. You, know, you can go and learn more from the Institute Manual on this, but there's a spirit world and he can come there and he can He'll be held accountable for what he understood and the choices he made, but he also has opportunities to learn and to change. And, you know, like, I think there's promise in his voice. And I love that in this moment, even though he's been reviled by one man, he comforts another. It's just who he is. He comforts in his moments of pain. And I think it's remarkable. I, I also love the request. It kind of reminds me of what we studied in the Old Testament with Joseph when he was in jail and he requests that the, is it the butler that gets released, remember him, and then he doesn't remember him for years. I just, I think there's some 
parallels that are just kind of fun to, to read and to study. Then you see the sun darkening. So I think it's Elder Holland who talks about when the, when the savior of the world is in this much pain, even the world darkens, like the sun can't shine. And so that's what happens for three hours. There is a darkening that happens in the Luke account, the veil tears first, and then the crucifixion happens. And then you have that phrase from the century. And certainly this was a righteous man. What's interesting about that is this is a Gentile. This is a Roman. I actually wonder sometimes if it's the exact same centurion that we studied earlier in the year who had a son or a servant, it was hard to tell which, who was sick and Jesus healed him from afar. And that remember the centurion had come to the Savior and said, I know you can do this. You don't even have to come to my house. Just say he's he's better and, and then he is. I wonder if this is the same man. I don't know for sure. There's probably a lot of centurions. But in 49, you see there also was... Um, his acquaintances come back. Some of the scholars I read said this seems like the apostles coming back because the women who are his disciples and others gather in these hard hours between when he has actually died on the cross and when they can take the body and have it put in the sepulcher. So that's what you're going to see around 49, the acquaintances gather. But I actually love what you see at the very end of Luke. So this is where you see Joseph of Arimathea comes and he takes down the body and then he cares for it. He buys new linen for it and spices and he takes care of the body. What's interesting is it says in 55 at the very end that the women are watching and they see how the body was laid. So just like I talked to you about before, where I wonder sometimes if he didn't know quite what he was doing, he's doing the best he can, but they're kind of like, oh, <laughs> that's not quite right, you know? And so they want to go back in and fix it. And so what we know is they will come back to fix it, right? They'll have spices to come and fix things because things had to be done in a rush before the Sabbath began. What's really interesting to me is these women won't break the Sabbath. Neither will Nicodemus, neither will Joseph of Arimathea. Like they, they honor the Sabbath, even though the leaders of the Jewish faith at this point that they know just executed the Son of God, they still will follow the commandments. And I think that's remarkable. The other thing I think is remarkable is what, what is happening here. So you remember that conference talk from Elder Stanfield, where he talks about the imperfect harvest and where there was grain that was falling out of the truck or the combine or whatever it was. And he was talking to his dad about it. And he said, you know, it's the best this machine can do. And then later he saw the birds come in the fall and they ate all the seeds or the grain that couldn't have been collected. And he said, the Lord perfected it. That's what I think is happening at the end of 22. And this is why, because they've just seen the Savior be quickly taken care of beautifully, but quickly because the Sabbath is coming. And they now need to come back on Sunday. You know, the Jewish Sabbath is from sunset to sunset on Friday night to Saturday night. And so they want to come back on Sunday to perfect, right, to, to fix what maybe Joseph did in a hurry. They want to do right. And the spices that maybe he had to hurry and do, they want to do right. The very fact that it was done imperfectly by Joseph of Arimathea and later that we'll learn Nicodemus was there as well means they come back on Sunday morning with spices. And guess what happens when they come back on Sunday morning with spices? <laughs> then they are in the exact place they need to be to be able to witness, in fact, be the first witness that he is risen. That's a perfect harvest. You know, I just think there's so many times in my life where I'm like, why did you let this fall apart? Why? And then later I see, oh, that makes sense now. I can see why I had to have that fall so I could have this high, right? And I just think you see a lot of that beautifully at the end of Luke. Okay, now we're going to head into John's version of these same events. So now we're in John 19. The John account is actually pretty similar, but there are just some key differences. For example, in this one, you see Pilate scourge Jesus first and then present him to the people. In fact, his phrasing is, behold the man. He shows this broken, bloodied Jesus and says, behold the man. Like, do you, I think he's trying to get across to the people, like, isn't this enough? Have I done enough? You know, like he's trying to satisfy their bloodlust and he says, behold the man. I love, there's a talk from Elder Uchtdorf where he, I think that's entitled Behold the Man, but he basically says they could see him, but they didn't have eyes to behold him. And that our job as disciples and saints is to, to really behold the man, the, the whole man, what he offered, who he is, why he offered it. We have to behold him. And the way he phrased it, I put it in the notes, but he put these beautiful phrases in of like, when you are struggling, when you are feeling dark, when you are heavy, behold the man. When you, you know, like he, he uses this as this key phrase for me to keep in my mind when things are hard, behold the man, and then remember who he is and what he has offered. And I just loved it. So go read his talk in the notes. You're also going to see um, Pilate's 
wrestle with power. It's interesting on this one is um, Jesus isn't answering him. And then 11, Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me. Because Pilate basically says to him, I have all the power here. If you want to not die, you need to convince me, you know, I have all the power. And Jesus' response is, all the power you have was given you from above. I'm sure Pilate heard that and thought, Rome. And I think Jesus meant something much, much higher. You know, <laughs> everything that they have at this point in time comes from God in some way or another. And Jesus is like, I, I have 12 legions of angels. I mean, that's not what he says here, but he's like, there's, there's no power that I need to fear. It reminded me a lot of what we studied with Moses and the adversary. Remember when he's like, when he encounters God and he talks with God and then Lucifer tries to come back and he's like, who are you that I should worship? Like the stark contrast was so vivid to him that he was like, I don't care how big and loud you sound. I, uh, you are not the one. I will not worship you. And I think that's what's happening with the Savior here too. He's so clear on who he is and who God the Father is that there is no mortal power that can shake him. Of course, right? So then from that point forward, Pilate seeks to release him, which I thought was fascinating. What's interesting is what the Jews say to Pilate. They basically say he's claiming to be the son of God. What you have to understand is Pilate's a Roman. Romans believe in demigods and all kinds of different theories about gods, right? And so for a man to claim that he is the son of God and has shown this remarkable power and his wife had a dream and all these things are starting to like co coalesce in Pilate's mind. And he's like, oh no, you know, it actually says his fear increases because he hears that phrase. And they, but at that point he's, he's already given up a lot of his power to the people and to the Jews. And he's not courageous enough to take a stand. So the same storyline basically plays out. Uh, he puts, he puts the savior in front of the people. He is scourged. He is crucified for hours. The same darkness occurs. What's different about the John account is what happens with John and Mary. So Mary, his mother, is at the cross. And I just found myself aching for her. And I wondered, were they so close to Jerusalem? You know, this is supposed to be just right outside the, that, the city wall. Um, if she remembers really clearly being inside the city at the temple when Simeon told her that her soul would be pierced. You remember that when we studied it in Luke 2? And... I just wonder, I mean, that's like a stone's throw away. I guess maybe a far stone's throw, but she, yeah, this must have been so hard, even though she knew it had to happen. And he probably had lots of talks with her about why it had to happen. You know, she's the one in my mind who, when his first miracle happens at Cana, she's the one that says, okay, Jesus, if it's time, it's time. And, and I feel like he kind of says, okay, if you're ready, Mary, then here we go. You know, he loves his mother. He honors her always. And I just think there is this tight bond between them. And because of that, he makes sure she is taken care of. So he turns to John and says, behold thy mother. And to Mary and says, behold thy son. It's interesting because Jewish custom would say that he, that she, her care as a widow and, you know, in this weakened state should go to the next oldest. And we know Jesus had brothers, but we also know that those brothers are going to go and serve, right? A lot of them are going to become missionaries of sorts to go out and help people convert. And so I wonder if the reason he, he connects her with John, not just because he loves John, but also because John is the one that will never go. She'll never have to say goodbye to John. You know, John stays indefinitely. And so where Mary's had to lose Joseph and she's had to lose Jesus, she will never lose John. And I think that's a really tender part of this offering. I also think it's an incredible way to honor the commandment that is given to honor thy father and thy mother. Because he honored his father profoundly by completing this perfect atonement. And he honors his mother by caring for her at this very last minute. You know, where things are at their peak, he takes care of her. Is there a more profound way to honor that commandment? I, I don't know it, if there is. Um, and then it's finished in 30. That's what it says. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I love, there's a quote from Elder Hales that's in the note. And he talks about how, isn't it beautiful that in third Nephi, so just a little bit after this, after it is finished, what the father says is, behold, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name, hear him. I think the father could not be more pleased. I mean, we know that he has done everything he's been asked to do. And I love that when he gets a chance to introduce his son to the Nephites, he does it in such a full way. You just have to visualize the embrace. We're going to study this next week. So next week is the resurrection and it's going to be glorious. But I love, there's a talk from Elder Holland where he talks about 
those missionary hugs that happen. We'll go into it next week, but that's what I picture, that embrace that must have happened between the Father and the Son when they're finally reunited again. And I just think there will be so much joy and rejoicing because it is finished. At this point in time, Satan is defeated. There will be spoils of war that he will gather throughout the centuries as people still turn to him and follow Satan. But the victory is won. He will be conquered and has been conquered. And that that this is a major tipping point in the history of the world. And I just think we you can't go too fast through it. I think you have to just enjoy it and soak it in. There is a triumph in those verses. After that, you're going to see the same story of of Joseph of Arimathea purchasing the tomb and taking care of Jesus. or purchased, I don't know if he purchased the body. It seems like he probably bribed Pilate or offered something. Gets the body. The difference is now Nicodemus is in the story. So in John's account, you have both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus doing what they can for the Savior. In fact, that's what I wrote in my margins. Because Nicodemus had a chance to follow the Savior before. Remember, he's the one that came to the Savior at night and had questions about baptism, and the Savior was trying to teach him, like, aren't you a leader of the Jews and you don't know what these things are? I think Nicodemus has been a reluctant follower to some degree. And I don't know, I don't know his story. It's not written. But I wonder if he worried about what he could have done. And I love that in this moment in time, he chooses to give all he can. Because for all of us, when we fear that we have not done what we could have done, the answer is do what you can. Turn to the Savior and do what you can today. And that's what he does. Because he brings enough spices that would have fit like a royal family. It's, I think, 100 pounds or something is what they write it. It's, it's this gigantic, magnanimous offering. Um, and I don't think it's trying to buy favor. I think he's just sorry that this man is gone and he wants to do everything he can. And so do the women. And so all of those Jews who loved him are there and they take care of him. And that's going to set this beautiful stage for where we go next week when the women come back after the Sabbath and see the tomb empty. But I can't get there yet. So come back next week and learn even more. Welcome back, guys. It's time for the creative side of week 25. I know there was a lot to study and to discuss, but hopefully these object lessons will help you get them to stay in your kids' minds. I think these are really big concepts to study and to understand. So I'm hoping by making some really memorable options for you to teach with that these key concepts and doctrines will sink just a little bit deeper. So the first one we're going to talk about is the Easter lily. So one of the traditions of Easter is to see these beautiful white lilies. And I thought it would be cool if we created one, but then used it to teach a really key lesson. This week, the Savior says seven specific things from the cross. And they're referenced in several conference talks and in some beautiful Enzyme and Leahona articles. And you can kind of break down what each of those phrases means, why he said them, and what it shows us about his character. So I decided to create these. Technically, it's a pen. So thanks to Violet's help, we turned these into ballpoint pens, but you really could just make them as a simple lily as well. But inside each of these petals, we're going to talk about each of those key phrases that the Savior says on the cross. And then I also, they actually have an image of the cross within them. And that's because I want to give your kids a chance to understand why so many other Christians in the world cherish the cross. And often you'll see it on someone's necklace or in their home. And I thought this would be a good chance to talk about why you see that and why we should respect that in other faiths and why our faith doesn't necessarily do that. I'm hoping to kind of echo Elder Holland's message from conference and, and bring that out. And you can do all of that with this simple object lesson. Okay, the second one is even easier. This one, you just need two rubber bands. Ideally, two different colors of rubber bands that makes it look a little cooler. And this is to teach you about well, to help you teach your kids or your classes about how the Savior voluntarily offered his life. Although they're going to read about horrific things happening to the Savior at the hands of the Jewish leaders and the Romans, he did not die at their hands. He gave up his life. In fact, what you'll read over and over again is that he yielded. He, he gave up so that he could offer his life for us. And this little magic trick, basically that's what it is. It's a magic trick where you, where you will show your kids something that happens, that, that looks impossible, that will occur. And I'll walk you through it in a second. It's just really cool and really easy. And I promise your kids are going to want to not just see you do it, but learn how to do it themselves. Okay, the third one is a bit more traditional, especially for all of you families in the South. I'm sure you've made resurrection rolls 
before on Easter. I'd actually never made them before, <laughs> but I decided this time I wanted to create some with a little bit of a mech mom twist. So instead of using the traditional crescent dough, although you could totally do it that way if you're in a hurry, I give you a recipe. It's the same dough we've used to make those pretty snowflakes that we made last December. Uh, and a way to make resurrection rolls or what I'm calling empty tomb rolls uh, to, to learn more about what happens this week. So even though they're traditionally taught as a way to showcase what happens to the Savior and how the tomb is empty, I actually loved what we saw just before it this week. When you see people like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, the women, all these people take such delicate care of his body and do the very best they can to take care of him and then do the very best they can to honor the Sabbath day still. I just think the pairing of those things is beautiful and you can actually teach it as you create these empty tomb rolls. So if you don't know the recipe, you can either make the dough that I tell you and you can make a bunch or you can go buy a crescent roll like in the tubes at the grocery store and then you just need cinnamon, sugar, and marshmallows. Ideally the size marshmallows that you would like roast over a campfire. If you want to do the bigger square ones, those can work too, but it's totally up to you. Just need marshmallows, some dough, and some cinnamon and sugar, and you'll be all set on that one. Okay, once you have all those supplies in order, come back. Those of you who are in the full course, I'm going to walk you through each and every one of these and hopefully give you a better idea how you can pull them off in your families and in your classes. All right, you guys, let's get going. Okay, you guys, that's it for week 25 and your first week of blue belt level training from the Savior, our master teacher. So I hope you get a chance to soak it all in. I know it's a lot. I know it's heavy like we had last week, but it sets a beautiful stage for the hope-filled Sunday morning that's about to come. That's where we go next. So take time, help your kids understand the sacrifice so that they can rejoice even more in the glorious you know, resurrection morning that we're about to get to. So enjoy it. If you need extra help this week, you're always welcome to join me on Instagram. That's Monday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. I'll talk through some of the insights. I'll walk you through some of the object lessons, maybe give you some tips that I forgot to say here. And hopefully you can ask questions and I can respond and we'll be there for about an hour. If you don't get a chance to see it live, you're welcome to just watch it in my feed anytime. You can find it at least for the next week. It's always available for you. The other thing I would tell you is you can leave questions for me on the discussion boards. If you're in the course and if you're not in the course, you can reply to the weekly emails or you could just message me on Instagram and I'll try to get back to it as quick as I can. But otherwise, enjoy your week, you guys. It's it's a beautiful week where you get to see all four vantage points of the Savior and you're seeing something truly remarkable, this pinnacle moment of triumph that we we can't put too big of a spotlight on. So I hope you enjoy it. And then I hope you come back next week for an even bigger, brighter light on resurrection morning. I think it's going to be incredible. All right. Enjoy this week, you guys, and I will see you on Monday.